The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. The numbers are staggering. Almost five people a day in BC are dying from what the coroner's service calls illicit drug toxicity, also known as opioid death. That adds up to more than 1,095 people from January 1, 2022 to the end of June. Herpel Hundal says there has been nothing transformative or innovative in the field of medication to assist people going through detoxification for the last 25 years. The current solution is to switch users from their opioid of choice to an opioid agonist therapy like Suboxone or Methadone, both of which research demonstrates produce marginal benefits. Hundal says the time's up. We need to access innovative and transformative solutions, otherwise there will continue to be escalating numbers of deaths. One such alternative is ibogaine, a psychoactive substance that shows promise in the treatment of opioid users. In New Zealand, where the use of ibogaine is legal, a study available online at the National Library of Medicine reported that a single ibogaine treatment reduced opioid withdrawal symptoms and achieved opioid cessation or sustained reduced use in dependent users as measured over 12 months. The report went on to say Ibogaine's legal availability in New Zealand may offer improved outcomes where legislation supports treatment providers to work closely with other health professionals. The same is not true in Canada. I invited Herpel Hundile, the Director of Clinical Services at Universal Ibogaine, to join me for a conversation that matters about the risks and the benefits of Ibogaine in addressing one of our biggest health challenges. Herpel, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. It really is one of our biggest health challenges, isn't it? People dying from the use of op opioids. Yeah, it really is. Um, and I think um, what's more important is that it really hasn't received the kind of attention uh, in this country um, that it deserves. We've had two sort of um, epidemics that coexisting and if I think we look at like uh, COVID-19 and how the municipal, provincial and federal governments have responded to those is vastly different than how we've seen those systems um, show up in the opiate crisis for individuals. Do you think part of the problem is that we have stigmatized users of opioids and we go, oh well these are people who have made variety of choices or they're suffering from mental illness and so therefore it's not really a health issue yet like could that be the reason even though it may not be the fact yes I think absolutely that that's definitely one of the reasons why you know the opiate crisis hasn't received the kind of attention is the stigma around who is your classic opiate user and you know often media sort of like adds to that stigma by if you look at anything you know you have people on the downtown east side that look like they're you know homeless and they're not you know doing well and everyone's like oh yeah those are the people that are dying of the opiate crisis and statistics actually don't support that at all it, yeah. Well, they actually support one another quite well. They're all uh, walking around with Narcan uh, kits and, and actually can come to the aid of each other uh, because they, they use in an environment where there are others who are watching out for them. Correct. So who then is the user that's dying? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Stuart. The individuals that are dying, um, the statistics support that it's uh, young men. Um, between the ages of 30 to 55 nationally. Um, and often these are people like addiction, it's interesting, is not sort of a moral choice that people make. It really is a, a health issue. And it hasn't really been treated as such by our society. And even our government hasn't nationally treated like people with addiction as people that are, are suffering from an illness. And so the people who are actually suffering from the, this disease um, are people who are professionals, people who are construction workers, people who are housewives, um, who for some reason, you know, and the, you know, prescription of the opiates, the legal subscription of opiates has not helped. And then people don't know what to do, and then they go on, they can't stop the opiate use, and then they, 
you know, the doctors will say, no, I, you know, I can't prescribe, and then they look for alternate ways to get, like, their drug of choice. And so, it's, like, addiction isn't who um, the public thinks addiction affects. And so I think the stigma is a huge reason why the opiate um, crisis hasn't received the kind of attention that COVID-19 has received. And I think the other thing that's important here to note is that nationally, we last year in 2021 had almost 9,000 people die of um, illicit drug use. 9,000. Yeah. And 90% of these people didn't think that they were going to die. And that's because of the contaminated drug supply and, you know, the other kinds of issues that go around with that. 90% of those people picked up something to use and didn't think, oh, this is going to be the last time I use and I'm not going to be alive. And so if I look at those numbers and part of what we talk about in patient safety science is uh, we look at, you know, sometimes we talk about, you know, the number of airplanes that go down. And so if I look nationally, as of last year, basically three commercial airlines are going down on Canadian soil every month. The equivalent of three yep. planes crashing every month. And yet it's not getting the kind of attention that three plane crashes would. Well, I just think about, you know, when I'm watching the news and I see a plane go down and like the kind of media coverage that that, that one flight gets. And, and it's not to take away from the horrors of that happening, but it's like... There's a whole bunch of stuff happening in the background here on Canadian soil that no one is really talking about or doing anything with. Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So... People are not unaware of or immune to the impact of this, and there have been efforts yeah. to move forward. In the introduction I talked about right now, there's the opioid agonist uh, treatment program, yeah. um, but it shows marginal results. Correct. Is that not at least a step in the right direction? It absolutely, it, it is. But what I'm saying is that whatever we've done to date, especially in BC here with the decriminalization of, of small amounts of drug, naloxone kits, um, safe injection sites, it hasn't done enough to impact the numbers. The numbers are still increasing. And so I think part of it is that we need to go even further. And I've talked to lots of these people that are on um, Suboxone and what you'll hear from people is that it's not the answer because all they're doing is switching from one drug to another drug and the other drug has side effects and then often what people will try and do is use both mm -hmm. right and and then the other issue around this is ibogaine is a rapid detox but it's not a magic bullet to allowing people a lifetime of recovery and so that's the other thing too is addiction does require long-term recovery Mm -hmm. along with something like ibogaine to give people that rapid detox. Well, one question that I know that a lot of people ask is, is recovery possible? Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, recovery is possible. Um, and many of us at Universal Ibogaine have either been on the other side of addiction or have had family members that have um, struggled with addiction. So it's a bit of a passion project for lots of us that are involved in this project. Um, recovery is possible. The rates of recovery um, are not great. But, you know, there's lots of evidence to sort of support that if people get the right type of care at the right time in a sustained manner, then recovery is possible. Absolutely. So explain to me, what exactly is Ibogaine? Because it appears to be a very potent substance. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting because my, my own journey sort of in understanding what ibogaine is was after about 32 years uh, practicing in um, mainstream medicine, I was asked to go down to Cancun and like, you know, does this thing really work to just, and I, and I went completely thinking, okay, this just doesn't sound like this is too good or this is something going on here. And so I went down there and I worked with uh, a physician um, who has basically provided the most amount of ibogaine treatments. And what's interesting is many of his patients actually fly to Cancun, Mexico um, to get treatment, and 80% of those patients are coming from either the U.S., where ibogaine is on Schedule 1, which means it's, you can't use it, or they're coming from Canada. 
And so what's interesting to me about that is that if you know about ibogaine and you've got the socioeconomic means to get treatment, you can actually go and get treatment with ibogaine out of the country. But you have to be somebody who is able to afford that and, and secondly, knows that this is available. Okay, two kind of streams of questions. Uh, first of all, how does it work? Like, what do we understand about what are the you know, chemical reactions yeah. uh, within the patient? Yeah. And then uh, what kind of setting does it need to be administered in to have the um, yeah. best possible outcome? So ibogaine is what they call the granddaddy of psychedelics. It has, the, uh, it has quite a cardiac risk um, profile, which means in the wrong hands, under the wrong circumstances, it can actually prove to be quite fatal. In other words, don't do this alone. Don't do this alone. And ibogaine is not something that somebody would use as a recreational drug. Um, and uh, incidentally, ibogaine was first discovered in North America by a gentleman called Howard Lotsoff who was a heroin user and he decided with a group of friends that they were going to try this stuff for get high. And what ended up happening was him and half the group ended up after their first dose not craving hmm. drugs. And so that, so he spent the rest of his life trying to get ibogaine sort of known worldwide in the world of addiction. And how ibogaine works is um, it basically, sort of to put this into sort of layman terms, it basically is a rapid detox within 24 to 36 hours. You take it orally and um, it will uh, reset the brain to pre-addictive states. And people, as you mentioned earlier in your introduction, Stuart, um, report that their craving for their drug of choice or their opiate of choice goes away. So it's that narrow window of opportunity for people to, and some people have reported that, you know, when they take the ibogaine, there's um, something that happens uh, where they feel like they've had a spiritual experience and they understand why it is that they're using. So they go back to the pain of understanding why, what, what is it about my life? Like, what is it about my trauma? Why am I using? And some people say that that's one of the most, you know, sort of crucial aspects of them learning to, you know, understand their addiction and seek recovery. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So let's say you're in a position where you can get this treatment. Yeah. What's the process like? You, uh, do you stay within a uh, facility where you're being cared for yeah. during that detox period. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and, I, and, you know, the literature and both, like, you know, sort of experiences have said that ibogaine is not something that you'd order online, have it delivered at your home, or do it by yourself or anything like that. So what happens um, in the clinic that I went to visit is that a patient gets or an individual comes down and they get um, basically put on a short-acting opiate and the physician and the medical staff basically clean out their system from their drugs of choice. And often people uh, will not necessarily tell you everything that they've taken. So the patient is given a few days to basically clean or wash out their system, but to prevent the withdrawal symptoms, they get put on short-acting morphine. Oh, okay. And then the other thing that happens uh, sort of before and during this period is that the medical staff actually screen the individual undergoing ibogaine therapy and there are some very clear indications for people that would not qualify for ibogaine therapy and those that would. And obviously at the top of that list would be anybody that's got cardiac issues or like a significant uh, psychiatric history. Uh, because ibogaine is going to in essence put them yeah. to work. Yeah, absolutely. Their body's going to be working. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, blood work, a 12 lead ECG, a complete medical history, all that happens. And then the individual undergoes, if they're deemed appropriate, they undergo ibogaine therapy. Uh, and, you know, that lasts probably anywhere. People will go through um, sort of what they call sort of a, sort of a, 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 a dream-like, a sleep-like state uh, where everything is quite quiet. And that individual is monitored by the registered nurse one-to-one um, -one for the next 24, 36 hours. So in the introduction, I talk about a single treatment. Yeah. Is that what we're looking at here, a single treatment, or are there better uh, outcomes if there is a second treatment, let's say, 
a couple of months later. Um, so interestingly enough, you know, ibogaine is, has not been studied in large uh, human clinical trials as of yet. There's been the observational data that's because come out. Because it's a Schedule One drug. Yeah, mm. in the U.S. it's a Schedule One drug and, you know, as a result of like a um, whole bunch of political um, sort of situations in the U.S. and say no to drugs and stuff, the study of ibogaine in the U.S. Basically ended once ibogaine became Schedule One, which is absolutely a banned substance. Right, you but can't do tests. You can't do anything. No, no. And in Canada, um, in 2017, um, Health Canada put ibogaine on the prescription drug list. So, it yeah. So does that mean that you can run clinical tests in Canada now? Yes. So oh. what it means is Health Canada recognizes that ibogaine, in fact, could have some beneficial purpose. Um, but also has recognized the, the risk profile of ibogaine needs to be mitigated before people can actually be able to administer or prescribe ibogaine for therapy. But and wouldn't that be true of other treatments that we uh, are presented with with different uh, health issues? There are, there are risks. Right, and, and that's absolutely true, Stuart. That's a great question. Um, those medications or drugs or substances have had clinical trials that are very clear in outlining what are the risks, how can those risks be mitigated, and so to date, we are, um, we are basically poised to start phase one clinical trials here in Canada with um, ibogaine. Okay, how soon? You say you're poised, but how soon can those trials begin? Because, and I think it's important for anybody who's watching, that yeah. doesn't mean that uh, they can just sign up and uh, no. they're going to be part of this, this study. Yeah. Uh, there's a process that you would go through to be uh, somebody who would be part of that trial. So uh, how soon and then what would that process be? Um, well, how soon um, is currently accessing ibogaine um, it has been a bit more challenging than, you know, I think initially we had anticipated. Just for the treatment. Absolutely. Hello? Yeah, due to supply chain issues globally, as we've heard. Um, and to actually manufacture ibogaine takes a considerable amount of money. And ibogaine comes out of West Africa. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do is um, have people that are ready to produce ibogaine and, you know, to produce it with the kind of quality that we need for clinical trials requires that it comes from a facility that has got high standards of manufacturing. I can imagine the highest. Yes, yes, mm. yes. We're talking pharmaceutical uh, quality yeah. uh, manufacturing. Correct. Yeah. It, it's called um, GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices, yeah. right? So that's kind of where we are at right now. but. The wonderful thing about, you know, our partnership with the clinic in Mexico is we've been able to, um, I believe Dr. Sol has treated almost 4,000 people um, at this point. Um, and we have taken um, 200 of those uh, individuals and basically um, looked at the psychometrics. We do all kinds of sort of psychometric testing when people come in around depression, uh, their withdrawal scores, um, you know, their quality of life. And what we've seen is that those 100 people that Dr. Sola has treated have actually done very well with the single ibogaine treatment. And we've got like the data to prove through psychometric testing and vital signs that the patients actually did quite well. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. How long will the clinical trials take and then what's the process that follows the results that you get from that trial? Um, clinical trials typically can take anywhere from three to five years and require um, a great deal of funding. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, um, the market being what it is right now, um, funding is 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 not as easy as was initially planned just because of where we are with global markets. Um, so three to five years. And as far as who would qualify, it would have to be somebody who is an active opiate user um, who meets all of the inclusion criteria for the clinical trial study. It's a process ahead of us, but 
the, yeah. it has to start somewhere, doesn't it? It does. It does. And I, and I don't think I'm saying that Ibogaine is going to solve the opiate crisis, but what I am saying is it's the most transformative sort of treatment that we've seen in a long, long time to treat opiate addiction, whereby the individual has a choice to then move into abstinence rather than drug substitution therapy. People are going to be asking right now, okay, how do I find out more? Uh, even though it's early stage, yeah. uh, there are a lot of people who yeah. uh, will want to know. And, and I say that because a number of years ago, I had a fellow on as a guest mm -hmm. who uh, was, was and I mean, he may still be addicted, I don't know, yeah. but he was on one of the uh, you know, replacement uh, treatment programs, which was giving him some hope. Oh my gosh, has that episode been viewed like one of the highest viewings of all times because yeah. people are desperate for answers. Yeah. You know, yeah, and that's the sad situation, Stuart, of where we are right now in this country with individuals suffering from, like, you know, addiction, is there are not a lot of choices. You know, and, and to further, not, there's not a lot of choices as far as, like, what can I do as far as medication, but there's also not a lot of choices if you look at treatment beds you know, um, evidence-based uh, long-term recovery. Um, there, I mean, there is such a deficit. Basically, the patchwork of how we treat people who have got opiate addiction um, is, is it's, 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 like a, it's like a patch. Like, I mean, there's something here, there's nothing here, there's something here, there's nothing here. We don't have a comprehensive system in this country or even in this province, which has got one of the worst problems in the world. Like, it, it's shocking. It's shocking to me that, you know what, we have not been able to mobilize around this epidemic the way we have mobilized around COVID. And I, the question I ask is, why not? Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and so it's time. Like I said, time is up. We need to mobilize, like, as a municipal, provincial, and federal body to help people. So right now, those with the means could go to Mexico. You bet. If you're successful with the trials, yeah. and I know it's years from now, could it then become part of a treatment program that would be accessible to a far greater number of people here in British Columbia? Absolutely. And that is our great hope. You know, as, as, as we move forward, um, you know, in clinical trials, probably somewhere around phase, late phase two, phase three, what we can then do is go to Health Canada and say, hey, listen, we've got the clinical evidence. And then what happens is that we're then allowed to treat people in the early stages through special access or the urgent drug list in Canada. Well, there's no doubt uh, what we're doing right now is uh, not stopping this terrible human tragedy that unfolds in front of us every day. Yeah. yeah. I wish you great success. Thank you very much, Stuart, for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.